Welcome to Kingdom Life Church and today's message with Drs. Dennis and Jennifer Clark brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its dedicated supporters. We are here to equip you with the how-to tools and practical effective ways for empowering your Christian journey. Join us as we explore teachings that bring healing through forgiveness and ignite transformation in both individuals and families. For more resources, join our mission. Visit us at forgive123.com. Let's embark on this journey together. Welcome, Kingdom Life Church Full Stature Ministries. Receive the tithes and the offerings from the ministries. There's a box in the back, and the door won't open unless you put something in. That's getting kind of old now, so I have to come up with something more clever. All right, but today's message is. Um, how to go deeper in God, and and it's, I think it's just uh, very timely. I'm saying, God, my people know this. People that have studied our material know this, but I think He wants to challenge you because uh, I can give you a message in an hour or less, but at the same time, the very message that I give comes out of my own experience, and it was months. As a matter of fact, this particular message was uh, a time. When um, never assume anything, you know, you got to be careful when you assume something. But I assumed that I had a good prayer life. And for some reason, God led me to say, teach me to pray when you already think you're doing okay. All right? And when I did, he, he literally took me deeper. And I, I want the opportunity for people to go deeper in God, uh, in spirit to spirit. So I, I guess the title is How to Go Deeper. And... There were seven areas that he dealt with me when I began that, and I already had uh, enjoyable time in the Lord. I knew how to uh, deal with my issues and everything, but this was like um, <clears throat> just like what I had asked. Teach me to pray. Once you are living in a spirit-to-spirit, -spirit, practicing the presence of God relationship, you, you haven't arrived by any means. None of us have arrived. I, I still want more. I like the Apostle Paul. This one thing I do, press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Not that I've already attained it, but uh, that I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the fascinating wonders of his personhood. That was my mission many years ago, and it's still the mission, and there's still room for improvement. And if you don't think I need room for improvement, just ask Jennifer. <laughs> huh? She'll tell you. Now, to go deeper, uh, I want to start out with just a simple concept called focus. You know, we, we all read the Bible. You can quote the Bible and say, fix your eyes on Jesus. But a lot of times nobody tells you how to do that. How do I do that? Fix your eyes on Jesus. You know, and most of the time... <clears throat> Most of the time, you're using the wrong organ. <laughs> Remember, you can't see with your ears, right? You can't hear with your eyes. You have to use the proper organ. And God wanted us to use our spirit, not our head. The head needs to be informed by the spirit. So use the proper organ. So... Uh, the repetition of what we've seen in everyday life for any believer, the spiritual concept is to be God-focused. Now remember, God-focused, you've got to have the right organ. God-focused, we're talking about touching the presence of God in your day-to-day -day life. From the belly, from the gut, an awareness of your spirit, the door of the heart, open or closed. And... You become God-focused, and then so that you stay spiritual, you ask to be God-searched. Scripture says, search me, O God. David said, search me for secret faults. Why, why would he say secret faults? Because he didn't know. And guess what? Neither do you. <laughs> There's a whole lot you don't know. You waste a lot of time figuring things out, but in reality... God focused on your spirit 
using the proper organ and day-to-day -day living as a Christian. That's why it's called a Christian walk in the spirit. It really means to use your spirit, not your head. God searched, and of course, God protected. And uh, peace will guard your heart and your mind. It not only protects, but it's, it's an offensive anointed part of your Christian walk. So God focused, God searched, God protected, and then you know what the result of that is? Say, like, okay, I'll do that. I do that as best I can. I'm focused on Jesus within me, in my spirit. I let him search me, discern. You know, the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, and it's that it will separate flesh from spirit. That's what I mean by God searched, flesh from spirit. Let God do the tell you whether it's flesh or whether it's spirit. And you know what I always liked about that scripture? It sounds like it's the word, like you're just reading the word, you're reading the word. The word of God is quick and powerful. But then it says, all things are naked and open to the eyes of him. See, that word is a person. Jesus and his word are one. So... You're, you're actually opening yourself to the scrutiny of God himself and welcoming it. So God focused, God searched, God protected, and that results in being God ruled. Are we supposed to be God ruled? Yeah. Let the peace of God rule. To the degree that peace rules in you, you are being God ruled. Um, now, Unsaved and even Christians who live a lot in the flesh fall into the next category. They are self-focused. And why would a person be self-focused? They'd want to be self-focused to cope with life. Think about an unsaved person. What are, that's the best they've got. Cope with life. Life throws at you all different things, no matter what your walk of life is. So without Jesus... You, you better learn to cope, right? One way or another. And you may use good means and you may use bad means, but you're coping. And apart from Jesus, the self-searching is simply you figuring yourself out, getting caught up in, in the mind game, and that's really self-control, not the fruit of the Spirit self-control. That's control. So you're playing that you are coping with life by being focused on self. Self is the center of your life. I've got to learn how to cope with life. Then when you do any searching, it's to control life. And when it comes to being protected, you take whatever means are available to you to escape anything harmful. So you're really trying to escape from life as it, is because you can't deal with it as it really is. You have to look for ways to hide, ways to ignore, ways to avoid. And you know, some people just isolate themselves totally and completely as a means. It's funny because even in an evil society, God made people to want to be social. So for me, one of the first lessons I learned was that people that isolate themselves, that's not just flesh, that's demons. A demon would love to isolate you because it can pick you off real easy. Isolated people are easy targets. So now, we have spiritual people who are God-focused, God-searched, God-protected, and this is what we practice in this church, and this is what we uh, actually endeavor to increase because it's by reason of use. A walk in the Spirit, you might start by crawling, but eventually you're go it's going to be a, a walk that is uh, kind of continuously constant. And you want to walk with that. Matter of fact, Bill Morford in his Bible said, one of the things that uh, is kind of missing in some of our interpretations of the Bible is that we fail to see that it is ongoing, that there's a continual concept to it. It's not just ask one time, seek one time, ask and keep on asking, seek and keep on seeking, like that. There, there, it was meant to be a flow of life, not just a choppy 
get the right answer, you know. Um, so the, you can be pretty carnal and be born again and be spending most of your Christian life coping, controlling, escaping, and the bottom line is you're self-ruled. That's a life where you are in charge, not God. You may very well be born again, but you're in charge, not God. He might be your savior, and I don't know to what degree your walk is like, but self-ruled is, is not anything that's pleasing to God. And we know, we know it's progressive, though, because the scripture says, desire sincere milk of the word that you might grow thereby. Strong meat belongs to them who are full age, who by reason of use have their senses exercised. That's our Tuesday night. The goal is to see, hear, and touch in the spirit. And there's physical feelings, emotional feelings, and there's God feelings. And most God feelings are too quiet for your flesh. So I want to challenge the believers, you know, you really want to have a spiritual walk, you've got to learn to be able to quiet your noisy flesh. Runaway thoughts, impulses, emotions, toxic emotions, negative emotions. You've got to bring them in submission to the Lord and quiet your flesh to where the spirit takes the ascendancy and suddenly then there is a realm of feeling that is supernatural. But yes, most of it for a day-to-day -day daily discernment would require you to not miss the quiet aspect of it. So then there's the focus for the codependent, what they would call codependent. They're others focused. We've dealt with people that almost their whole lives was based on being what somebody else wanted them to be. They're focused not on God, not on self, but on others. And others search, whatever they needed, I must provide for it somehow. And others protected. You had to be accepted and liked. Otherwise, you know, you'd have a meltdown of some sort. But those are actually others ruled. So there's self rule, God rule, and others ruled. And some people feel like that's their identity to be ruled by other people. That's not your identity. You are created as a one of a kind, a person who never existed before, never will exist again. You need to appreciate that uniqueness. Jesus in us might be the diamond, but we are all individual settings, one of a kind. That's where the value is. But you can't jump to the value. You have to move progressively in a relationship from trust to the love of God. Jesse Penn Lewis said, you will never know the love of God experientially if you don't trust him. You can't even get saved if you don't trust God to come in. Trust is the foundation. And we're going to get to that uh, in, in this concept on how to go deeper into God. So uh, what we're raising in this church, this is our intent. This is not for... Uh, uh, Babies, we're going to give you milk, but we're going to encourage you to grow up, start learning to chew, feed upon the Word of God, drink, don't just think, feed, don't just read, okay? And this church, it's the discipler concept. I was called to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. I was called to be the head servant and that is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, not look to me as being the one that does it to you with no effort on your part. I just go, and you're fine. Be nice if it was like that, though. What a, we sort of do that to me, and then I'd be fine. Instead, I've got to deal with the work of the cross, just like you do. All right, But the discipler is God and others focused. That sounds more like the gospel to me. Because you, the way you could say you've got this rich relationship with God is these people I can't handle. All right. The way you treat God is the way you treat people, and the way you treat people is the way you treat God. There's no escape. That's the gospel in the essence of love God and love one another. 
you, you can't escape that concept. So you can't pick and choose and say, uh, oh, I have this great relationship with God. Uh, not much with people, but, you know, I think people's overrated. You know, you know who needs relationship, you know? All right. So, but a discipler is God and others focused. They're God searched because everything that's done in you of quality is something you give away. You can't give something you don't have. So the discipler mentality, and most of you in this church, you, you, you're handling prayer calls from out of state, out of country, and everything like that. You're doing what we're talking about. That's a discipler mentality. You're not saying, Dennis, uh, there's a phone call here. Someone needs ministry. Will you do it? Sure, I can do it. But in reality, I'd rather troubleshoot your life and teach you how to do it more efficiently. All right? So the discipler concept is you're God searched, God protected, but you're God ruled. And your focus is God and other people. We saw people that would get ministry just to take care of their owies, so to speak. <laughs> Had no interest in helping anybody else. You were equipped to minister, every believer. So you don't just get fixed, you get fixed to give away. And so there's the, the spiritual individual, God-focused, God-searched, God-protected, they're God-ruled. And there's the, well, I don't know what you call it, carnal. Some people argue, say there's no such thing as a carnal Christian. I, you know, I think there's a fleshly Christians that are genuinely born again. <laughs> and they live like people in the world. All they're trying to do is cope. Constantly coping. Oh, the devil's beating me up. You know, the devil's attacking me. And it's interesting that they're not doing much in the body of Christ for other people, but for some reason the devil picks on them more than anybody else, more than leaders. I don't understand that. How come it's, he's, the devil is so after those people that are doing nothing and stragglers. Why does, why does the devil pick on stragglers? Gee, I don't know. But if you listen to their testimony, I, they would tell me, you don't understand, you're just a pastor, you don't understand what I've been through. I'm going, oh, well, maybe I don't, but Jesus does. <laughs> Can we go to him? That's really the way you have to handle it because they're, they're in a world all their own. That carnality is all their energy is spent on coping with life, controlling people and circumstances, and escaping any kind of hostility. You can run, but you really can't hide. And then there's the codependent that doesn't even know what it is to be focused on God a lot of times they don't even deal with themselves because they're others focused. But what we're moving toward is to learn how to go deeper in God the way God taught me how to go deeper in God. But we're going to be disciplers. The end charge is that I'm going to be a people helper, whether it's my own family, whether it's children, friends, neighbors, it doesn't matter. You just need to be available because God wants to use you with anything that's real in your life is worth giving to somebody else. If you have a testimony, you know what that means? There's an anointing on it. Any testimony of change in your life is a permanent anointed area that you could be giving to someone else. It's not just about you and God. It's you and God and others. That's the discipler mentality. God gave apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers, put them on the bottom so that they would equip the saints to do the work of the ministry building up a habitation of God in the Spirit. Mature people, people who have a voice. And when it's, we see on Tuesday night when everybody shares or Sunday morning when they, they share with intercession, what, what you're saying is that here is a people who are not a people who have become a people who are under the kingdom of voice. There's a term for you. Under the kingdom of voice. The word of God and the nature of God, Jesus and his word are one. We are in that kingdom. We are under the kingdom of voice. But that voice was meant to speak to us and to speak to others. To hear that voice from heaven in us and through us on planet Earth. That voice, that government, 
that rule of voice. And so the first place you would start in going deeper with God would be to learn, first of all, location. To go deeper in God is not to think or study more with your head. To go deeper in God, you go to Him. You go to the person. And the first of seven areas was what God unfolded when I said, Lord, teach me to pray. Even though I thought I knew how to pray, uh, I'm sure I did, but God was going to answer my prayer to go deeper. I believe he initiated that question, teach me to pray. I don't even think it was my idea. I think he wanted desperately to invade my life in such a way that we would have a more meaningful relationship than we currently have. He wanted us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of God. So uh, I, I saw that, the, that God's word is reality. We say truth, but sometimes we lose sight of the fact that truth is reality. Truth and reality. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am the way, the reality, and the life. And his will is for oneness. So his word is reality. The way or his will for us is he wants oneness. A deeper, richer sense of oneness. One with God and man, both. And the way that he does it is always the same. It worketh by love. And we say faith worketh by love. But uh, I think faith has to be defined to some degree because some people, faith to them is just to uh, step out in the dark. And it's like faith is a, something you just attach to, something you do that you have no idea what you're doing. Uh, but the thing that triggered it for me was faith is the substance of things hoped for. Once I saw that word substance, faith is not this big nothing. Faith is substance. And if you are a spiritual Christian, you should be having that faith, that substance, substantiated. There should be an awareness. There should be a no-so. That substance is being substantiated. I have my own no-so in my spirit and my knower. And so uh, the way he operates is love. So now this is a period of eight months, so you won't have to do this today. But I, I should put that on you, though. That'd be fun. Okay, do all of this today, okay? All seven steps. But this was an eight-month period where he walked me through, and at some point I must have, uh, actualized a certain element because then he moved to the, the next step. I must have sufficiently apprehended some of the truth. But the very first thing, and for me, uh, he said, Dennis, uh, I'm sending you to the school of the Spirit because he knew I wanted to go instantly when I got saved to Bible school instantly. And he wasn't going to let me instantly go to Bible school. He wanted me to go to the school of spirit and the prayer and have a relationship with him. And to this day, I am so glad I did that. All of the Bible schools that I added later were, were beneficial, but uh, everything that's significant was learned in the school of the spirit between me and him and that relationship. So the first thing was that um, in what I would call level one was the term uh, is undivided attention. And it followed a pattern that God's thoughts were toward me. I was used to being insignificant and rejected. I used the term invisible. So even though I had a, a good relationship with the Lord, he was telling me, I want you to open up because I'm going to teach you in three realms here. I'm going to give you a revelation. I'm going to teach you in the school of the Spirit 
how to cultivate that revelation. And then I'm going to call you on the carpet and you tell me if there's fruit. In other words, you tell me if it works. Otherwise, it's theory. I don't need theory. I don't need a dead-end street of religiosity. I wanted the reality of transformation. And if there's no transformation, there's no fruit, then I didn't get it. And so that, that first level was, Dennis, you were ignored, you were invisible, you were rejected. God knows your story. <laughs> Trust me. Uh, better than you. <laughs> and he started with, I'm giving you my undivided attention, but step one is, I am not an it. I am a person. And that kind of cuts through uh, the tendency to go religiously, R rules and regulations. It broke. No, a person. I want you to relate to me as a person. I'm a person, not an it. And then he fortified that because I was looking at uh, the, the Hebrew scripture. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, able to divide asunder. Now, what do you say? The word, the word, the word, the word, right? So you're thinking Bible, 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 the word is quick and powerful showed you it discerns your heart well that's all good then it said in verse 13 though all things that are naked and open to the eyes of him and that fortified it god is speaking that to me that yes he's the word yes yes there's the written word but jesus and his word are one his nature and his word match and he's telling me to exalt the person not just ink on the page. Meet the author to the ink on the page. That was the challenge. And from that revelation, I'll teach you how to cultivate that. And in the cultivating it, knowing him as a person, I had to shut up. I had so much to say, but it wasn't working again. It was taking me back to the basics. And the basics were said, I've got to learn to listen. He used uh, Isaiah, where it says, morning by morning, he awakens my ear to hear. And then he put a nice little footnote in there, just for me personally. This might not apply to you. But he says, uh, you don't really have anything to say until you've heard something, which is a good lesson for all preachers. <laughs> you don't really have anything to say unless you've heard something. Okay. Um, and so he taught me to listen, and he taught me that most supernatural is too quiet for your flesh. And that it took time, but there was a spiritual experience with that word time. It wasn't just 15 minutes on a clock. There was soul time and spirit time. Now, come on. Most of you have known this. At one time or another, you were in prayer, and the time supernaturally was different than what was on the clock. It was like, that is Holy Spirit time, and if you learn to appreciate that, you don't run ahead of God and you don't get behind. You don't walk in soulish time, you walk in God time, spirit time. And, it, and, it, and it, the benefit is tremendous because most of the mistakes are made when you're out of time, you're in a hurry. So... The very first step was, he says, okay, step one of seven. You're going to give yourself to me more fully and completely than you've ever done before. You're going to honor me as a person, and you're going to sit still until you could feel that time element change. Now, I gave myself to God. And in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. So I confessed uh, to him, cleanse me, start me out, start me out fresh and anew. I want to learn this, what you're teaching me. I'm giving myself to you, uh, I'm offering and presenting my body a living sacrifice. We know that's in uh, Romans 12. Uh, and... Uh, I'm going to enter your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise. I'm going to have a proper attitude because I'm going to do this right. And so the first thing, first step in giving myself to God, the first lesson for him to take me deeper and for him to take you deeper, he told me this. Remember, you, feel, you can feel as a Christian, you can feel insignificant. You can feel 
lost in a crowd, you can feel alone. All of those feelings can be very real, even in the midst of other people. And God wants to heal that first. If he's going to take you deeper, he's going to sit there and say, no, no, I made you an individual, a one of a kind, but you are individually members of one another. And you may not have a clue to that in spiritual reality, but I'm going to bring that to pass. So in other words, what God was showing me was that as much as I was a one of a kind individual, he made me to be connected with other people. There would be divine appointments that would become divine connections. Divine connections would, would become a, 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 an assignment, a corporate assignment, and then a divine purpose would flow out of that. So I think in this first step, God was revealing to me that my thoughts are continually toward you. That was in the Living Bible, Psalm 139, 17. The first thing that he taught was that I am a person. I want to be treated like a person. You don't get zapped or wham -o or using any expression that sounds like an it. That's just me. But he says, how precious are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. Psalm 139, 17 and 18. All of a sudden he made this real. He said, if I would count those thoughts, they're, they're, they're more in number than the sands of the sea. And when I awake, I'm still with you. And what he did at this point was, uh, I had a good prayer life, but I can remember feeling a little angst, uh, enjoying that touch spirit to spirit, heart to heart, breath to breath. And then, then uh, my, I was in a carpool to go to the work in the office in the first year that I was saved. And he'd be honking his horn. And it was like, what I was experiencing on a one-to-one, -one, I didn't want to leave it. And that's when God basically was saying, when I awake, I'm still with you. I'm going, God, I want to reciprocate. I want my thoughts to be continually toward you, but I can't. My mind's all over the place. And I got to go to work. <laughs> and he says, I made you capable of having your thoughts continually toward me. You can, there can be a reciprocity, but you have to use the proper organ. It's got to be your spirit, not your head. Not willpower, but the door of the heart has to learn how to remain open so that there is a flow and an interchange. Giving and receiving requires an open door. And most of the time when you start thinking in your head or planning a, a procedure of whatever during your day, maybe your to-do list or whatever, the tendency is to go back up to here and use what you've learned and you forget this. And what God was saying, this first step, this undivided attention, uh, uh, men might have a harder time dealing with this than women. But what God was saying is, Dennis, it's like Jesus in you down here in your spirit is precious cargo. And if a woman was eight months pregnant, she might be very uncomfortable, but she could still go to work and use her head. But she would have a dual awareness. She would be aware that I'm, I'm doing, um, doing payroll today on the job, but down here is precious cargo. You can do both at the same time. And what God was saying is, my thoughts are continually towards you. And because that appeals to that love nature of being wanted, someone thinking about me constantly, undivided attention, constantly delighting in a relationship with me, wanting that relationship, you'd have to be a fool not to want to reciprocate. So I want to reciprocate, but I didn't think I could. And God said, yes, you can, but you're using the wrong organ. Your head can't do it. Your head will just sidetrack you. You've got to use your spirit. And so uh, I, don't, I just didn't want to grieve, quench, or resist that Holy Spirit. I wanted his mind, his will, his emotions, him, 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 him. And I spent the time that was necessary. And God began to say, what you learned right here in this first step was special time and all the time. And Jesus had the same kind of walk, didn't he? 
Didn't he have special time where he went for prayer? But he practiced the presence of God all the time. He didn't go in and out of prayer. For him, it was a relationship that had special time of intimacy and all the time. Special time all the time, not in and out. Then, after that was so refreshing, welcoming God to search me and deal with anything. God, you desire truth in the inmost parts. You have access to the inmost parts all day long now. My thoughts are continually towards you. And my thoughts was not uh, coming out in words and phrases as much it was being with someone. Like uh, if you're a husband and wife or you're with a friend and you're in an automobile, that awareness that somebody's there even if they're not talking. Prayer is being with someone more than talking. It includes talking. It includes dialogue, it adds meaning, but at the same time, you cultivate the attitude that there's someone in the car. Sometimes Jennifer and I will drive, and I I enjoy having her with me compared to being alone. But we don't have to talk constantly. There's an awareness of presence that is relational. It's a real thing. Relationship is a real entity between two people. And it needs to be appreciated, cultivated, developed. It's even good for, uh, if you're kind of more the reserve type, not not necessarily the extrovert. Um, What I did training Jennifer in prayer is really, to me, what husbands should be doing with their wives. Maybe you're not a talker. Maybe your wife's not a talker. Let's say, how do you feel? Ask questions. There's nothing wrong with that. We're not mind readers. We don't second guess what's going on in somebody else. Ask them. I I always liked Jason's. I stole that from him. It was so good. It was like, how do you feel? How do you really feel? Come on, ladies. That's a good one, isn't it? Because... What's the average guy goes when he says, how do you feel? And you say, okay. (sighs) It's a selfish sigh of relief. But how do you really feel means I really care. I want to be part of the solution. Communication is important. And really what God was showing me was the highest form of communication is to be an expression. Jesus did it to Philip. Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Whoa. That's above and beyond words. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, the next step was because he was so real and he wanted this relationship and he was giving me this undivided attention, I wanted to make sure nothing was in the way. So the second step we call welcome presence. And it was funny because I was hearing, oh, I forget their names now. I think they're all with the Lord now. But way a long time ago, they taught on the seven mountains. Who was that, Jennifer? Uh, Francis Schaefer and Bill Bright, Francis Schaefer. That's the old timers that taught it. There's other people teaching it. But during that time when they were talking about the seven mountains of society, the seven pillars of society, I was thinking, you know what? What God's telling me is if you don't deal with the seven, the seven thrones on the inside, you're not of much value in those seven thrones of society. You can say you're a Christian, but I've watched Christians have meltdowns in those arenas that God assigned them to, whether it was government education business, uh, whatever, your church. So what the Lord had me do there to deepen it was, he said, this only takes like five minutes. Now, it did take me two, two months on each one of these at least before I went to the next one. God kept me on that one. It just kept amplifying it, fortifying it, expanding it, and I'm not going to give you all of that. 
I'm giving you the essence of it. The second element was welcoming presence, is that once you've found out that God really wants a relationship with you, and that, that you might have cut through some barriers to even believe that, that he, he loves me as much as he loved Jesus, that's kind of a hard concept for my head. But if you say so, God, then I want to know it in my knower, because my head's not capable of grasping that, that you love me as much as you love Jesus. I want to make my spirit available to that kind of love and welcome your presence. And God had me uh, open up. Here's the seven areas. Uh, I think in our last uh, journal that was published, uh, it's in there, the seven thrones. First of all, your spirit. Are you using the proper organ? Or are you just thinking, figuring out? Which is, for most Christians, your biggest handicap is your intellect. Intellect plus poor judgment equals foolishness. <laughs> so, that's Thomas Saul. <laughs> I always got a kick out of that. But, spirit, are you using the proper organ? Remember, you can't see with your ears. You can't hear with your eyes. And if it's going to relate to Jesus, it's not your head. It's got to be your spirit. Your spirit's the proper organ for relationship. And you've got to cultivate and develop that. Now, oh. The seven thrones are spirit, mind, will, emotions, your physical body, all relationships, that means even people you don't like, because that, that you'll have to deal with, you're murdering if you hate. <laughs> and all possessions. So there's spirit, mind, will, emotions, your physical body, relationships, finances, and are all possessions. You could just say all possessions. Those seven areas take five minutes before the Lord and say, am I functioning from my spirit or am I all stressed out thinking? Is my mind being influenced more by revelation and the word? or by runaway thoughts, negative thoughts. My will, that's down here, the door of the heart. Is my heart open or did I shut down so that I could get things done? Because the key to a relationship in God going deeper is holding that door open and leave it open. People are afraid that they like putting up the wall around people that are hostile. Like that's going to protect them. That doesn't protect you. That's self-protection. God protection is Jesus and peace. And let them be as hostile as they want to be. Nothing evil can penetrate the, the fruit of the Spirit, the peace of God. Peace really does guard your heart and your mind. But it, if you don't try it, you'll, it's theory. Right? You'd have to live that way. So your will, mind, will, emotions... Anything negative in the way of the emotions is coming between you and God. Is it that important? You have to ask yourself, is that that important? Or am I going to let the Holy Spirit say, I've removed that negative emotion right now. I receive forgiveness for allowing that thing to make a nest in my heart. Relationships. Uh, oh, I discern Sister So-and-So is a Jezebel. Uh, okay. You feel a little anxiety on that? Well, then maybe you ought to receive forgiveness for having the anxiety. And maybe you ought to release loving intercession for them because real discernment flows out of love. Let your love be with real knowledge and all discernment. Where's the redemption in your evaluation? Where's the redemptive solution? Are you just pointing the finger at people? All right? So welcoming presence then was to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord, was to present all of those areas before him and make sure that they were clean. You could do that in five or ten minutes in prayer. And I'll tell you what, it was so beneficial because in the hustle and bustle of life, they'll where you need to work on will vary from day to day. It won't always be the same area that pops up because life has that kind of 
interaction. Third area. He said, ask where you trust. I've given you undivided attention and built a relationship with you. I've taught you how to welcome my presence into all areas of your life. you got to win the battle within before you win the battle in life. If you're not winning within, you're not going to win without. But this third area said that you need to ask, we even coin a little thing in this church, to try or trust. Try, T-R-Y, temporarily resist yielding. You can't trust and be stressed at the same time. I know I upset my neighbor. He was stressed one day. And he was to, I said, well, you can't be trusting God and stressed at the same time. And he went away for, in a huff, came back, and two hours later said, you're right. You can't be stressed and trust. Trust is the opposite of stress. Trust is yielding. We live by dying and we fight by yielding. That's where the victory is. But... <clears throat> Asking where you trust, God was saying, you know, is the thing that I always liked about discernment, too, was that discernment always paid attention to who's initiating it. Who's, who started this? God, the flesh, or the devil? I don't care what you hear or see take place. Who started it? <laughs> you know, who's the source? And this came to my mind on trust. Uh, the scriptures in Jeremiah 17, I think that's 17.5. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength. His heart has departed from the Lord. He shall not see, he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places of the wilderness and a salt land which is not inhabited. If you're seeing a lack of provision, you know, it really could be just because it's your own efforts. You took matters in your own hands and you said, forget God. I can do that. I only ask God when it's something I can't do. There are people like that. God's only involved when it's something that they feel like totally incapable of. But if you're not seeing the kind of provision that you need, it says, curse, you're trusting in man. And, and trusting in man is not just other people. It means trusting in you, too. Trusting in the arm of the flesh could be trusting in yourself, trusting in others, to be and to do what really God wants to be and to do in you. Isn't that interesting? It is God who is at work in you to cause you to be and to do all that he called you to be, all that he called you to do. That's the grace of God. And it's God who works in you to will and to perform. <clears throat> Now, asking where you trust, this worked on me for a long time to just see any tension that I felt in my gut, I, would, I learned to release it. And I did that for weeks on end. Remember, I'm I only dealing with one area. Those other areas were somewhat established. I gave my undivided attention to the areas as they arose. So it was just on trust. And I was finding out how much better you feel without stress. <laughs> you imagine that? Stress means you are being controlled by people or circumstances. Oh, not God. And that was such an eye-opener that I practiced it. And then I'd get into a situation and I'd feel that, oh, let it go. And you you get proficient at it. It doesn't mean you don't feel it. it. doesn't mean there's no temptation. Temptation's not sin. It's what you do with it that matters. And you can learn to let go. If, eh, it's not that important. Oh, look at that guy that just cut in front of me and took my parking space. <sighs> you can do it that fast. Let it go. And you'll be the healthier for it. I did one, and I backed up just for the benefit of the other person. 
but we're going around and parking. And I pulled in, and I like to be facing out rather than back up. So I looked. The pace, place in front of me was open, too. So I went in there, and I got halfway in there, and a car pulled in, and he was planning to go in there. But he was a little upset. So I just backed up and let it go. Said, eh, it's, not, it's not really worth it, is it? It's a, it's a minor thing. Now, it was a big deal to him because he was really mad. That would have meant he would have had to go around another circle oh, and park somewhere else. That'd be the end of the world, wouldn't it? All right. So try or trust. But you could just use that acronym, temporarily resist yielding. And if you feel that tension in the gut, and like I said, when we travel church to church, I was very disappointed that 98% of all church people, regardless of the church we went to, if they saw somebody that they were not happy with, whatever, suddenly appearing in the grocery store, shopping, whatever, the first thing the Christian did was, oh, oh, there's, oh, there's Ralph, oh, there's Sally. What they did was they shut the door of their heart. They thought they were protecting themselves, but in reality, you weren't protecting yourself. You were making yourself vulnerable to anything in that atmosphere that could get you messed up. So, ask where you trust. Attitude was the next one. After trust for a couple months, seven areas, eight months, probably a, it was probably a month on most of them. It's probably what it ended up being. I remember it was an eight-month period for seven areas. So it's probably four weeks per. All right, so the next one was attitude. And by attitude, this church is, is strong in this. He was showing me that it's not positive and negative like you learn in the world. Positive words, negative words, positive words. The only true positive is that which has passed through the cross. And in a practical application, your attitude will determine your performance, but that attitude had to be a forgiveness lifestyle because that's where the cross crosses your will and his will cross. And you surrender to that will, and it's a romance of wills. That was the attitude. That's the fourth area. And the big emphasis there was forgiveness has to go to God, self, and others. And if in doubt, do all three. What are you going to do? Love too much? Forgive too much? It won't, it won't hurt. You won't be damaged by forgiving too much. The attitude that's a true positive has to be the work of the cross. The fifth area was love and discernment. Love and discernment comes out of Philippians 1.9 primarily. And it was, and this I pray, this is the apostolic prayer, and this I pray that your love may abound, overflow, more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. So, and we practice that in this church. Any discernment, anything you discern, I'm going to ask you, where's the redemption? Where's the love? What's the solution? Is it something we just tuck away and pray for? Or is it something you can actually minister to somebody to help them? Discernment works out of love. We pray that God would grant us, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power, through his spirit in the inner man. And the spiritual man discerns all things. So if you're going to be a spiritual man or woman, you discern all things. All of life then is opened up to scrutiny, but it's the scrutiny of the Holy Spirit with a built-in love response. And so you see a problem over there, and what are you going to do about it? 
that should be tagged on to the end of it, onto the discernment. Otherwise, it just becomes a lot of bitter judgment. And even some accurate discernment with doesn't necessarily you can be right and still have a bad attitude and not have a redemptive solution in it. You can be right and wrong at the same time. The sixth element after love and discernment was a word that the Lord called affirmation. And the affirmation was not a pat on the back. The affirmation was what you would see in the scriptures as an affirmation of being written on the tablet of the heart or receiving with meekness the engrafted word. It was when the reality of the word, you owned it. And you could tell that you owned it, because remember I said, all of this required me to prove it by asking if there was fruit. And the fruit that I saw from whether or not something was an engrafted word, is that truth or reality in Dennis's life? I found out that it was easier to obey that truth than disobey. I knew I owned it. And that could be a criteria. Is it easier to obey that or do it? Be a doer of the word, not just a hearer? Is it easier to do it? If it's still hard to do it, then you might not own it yet. And so you need that affirmation. It needs to be written on the tablet of your heart. There needs to be a work of the cross. And lastly, the seventh element, and this has been the vision from the time God called me to ministry, is we, what people call evangelism. For me, God called demonstration. When this gospel of the kingdom is demonstrated through all the world, then the end will come. You can preach something to the ends of the earth, but demonstration means you're living it. And from the base of the temple flows rivers of living water. Demonstration, it says, God gives you something, you write it down. Even Writing it down honors God. Absorb it. Absorb it into your nature. Pray it and then do it. You demonstrate a reality of what's real to you. You've gone deeper in God, and it's real. And so, demonstration, like we said in the beginning, the highest form of communication is to be an expression. You can argue with people with words. You can have theories, philosophy. But uh, I always remember what my friend Dr. Bez did when... I got such a kick out of that. He debated the atheist on PBS. And the topic was forgiveness. And the atheist thought forgiveness was foolishness. And Dr. Bez had his students trained. If you run into a difficulty with an answer, give the word of your testimony. In other words, kick it up a notch. The word of your testimony is... is proof positive that Jesus changed something, you can't argue with that. And then she went too long and she said, I'm sorry I went too long, the atheist. I'm sorry I went too long. And he said, that's very forgiving of you. <laughs> he, he enjoyed that kind of stuff. He, IQ 177. He was definitely a head person. I, I would scare him. He called me a mystic. You are a mystic. So, whatever. But, you know, good man. Very good man. So, Father, we just ask you to seal this work right now. Challenge people to take these, take them seriously in these seven areas and move forward in the things and the purposes of God in the days ahead. I believe we're going to have disciplers, a congregation of disciplers. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You've been listening to Drs. Dennis Clark and Jennifer Clark from Full Stature Ministries. To explore more life transforming resources and deepen your faith journey, please visit us at forgive123.com and our online school at teamembassy.com. All rights reserved under applicable law. For details, please see our copyright policy on our website. Again, 
That's forgive123.com.